Hello, my dear friends. Um, we are here now, a few hours away, just to start a Halloween celebration. And here I have uh, then an ambassador from the UK. Uh, so nothing better like that uh, to have a proper Halloween party. So here with me tonight, I have Evil Eddie Richards. How are you? Oh. Hello. Nice to meet everyone here. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the party. A couple of hours to go, and uh, just chilling out. Fantastic. Now. Something in the name. Why evil? Like there is an evil twin and a good twin in the family. Uh, well, that's actually a question a lot of people ask me, and it's not as sinister as as you might think, right? Mm. It it actually was because I, when I was in London in my early days, um, I was supposed to dress up for a Halloween party like this one, and I didn't dress up. So instead, the owners of the club they gave me a badge, and they wrote on the badge, "Evil Eddie Richards." So I thought, yeah, that's a really cool name. I think I'll keep that. Nice. So by breaking uh, then the dress code of the party, you got your nickname. So it's very nice. So that's really naughty, <laughs> definitely. Well, people, actually, people think it's because maybe it's because I, I don't smile so much when I'm DJing because I'm, I'm concentrating. So people have said, oh, it's because you don't smile. And other people have said, it must be because of your music because you play dark and evil music. And I'm like. Hmm. It's not that difficult. It's not that difficult. Let's talk about those early days because I have been reading a lot. Uh, and um, you first then started as a DJ until you got to the Camden Palace, yes, and then to the Clint Street when you then share and uh, then space with Mr. C. Yep. So, what what the, what was the music that you played there, and what was your source of music? Because in that days we didn't have digital stores. Yeah. So, how did you get your music? Because you are a reference then in, you know, house to the UK. Yeah. So, how did that happen? Um, when I started DJing at the Camden Palace, it was in the uh, early 80s, about 1982. And at that time, the new romantic scene in the UK had just taken off. People, you know, or bands were making music with drum machines, which, which meant it, you could actually mix it. And the Camden Palace was one of the first clubs in the country to actually have Technics turntables, believe it or not. We weren't like New York. New York was way ahead. Um, so I was working in probably one of the most famous clubs in the capital city of the, you know, of, of the UK. And I was resident DJ. It was like a dream come true. So I was buying all, you know, all these um, records from imports, mainly from record shops. Uh, I started collecting records, ended up with about 15 to 20,000 records, which I've got now. Um, and uh, then um, the music was probably like, say, say like Human League or Spandau Ballet or, you know, that, that, that kind of electronic music that I was mixing. But then house music started to come into the UK, started to get, we started to buy them on import. And I really liked that that raw basic sound um, and started to mix it in and it actually mixed in with that music that I was playing because it was around the same speed 120 to 130 BPM it mixed well so I could put I could put a track in say from yellow and then I could put a track in you know that came from Chicago and it, it would fit and as more and more and more of that music came into the UK I was buying more music and then um, people started to go and put wa uh, parties on in warehouses. So then it went from being like a club scene to a warehouse scene. And then it went from being a warehouse scene to an outdoor warehouse scene. Because people seemed to like that they didn't have to worry about what they looked like, what they could do. They just decided they would go out to uh, a party and... Uh, and in the middle of the fields and have fun and do what they wanted for you know for two days if they wanted to and it ended up that those parties got huge there was twenty-five thousand people going to those parties every weekend but it, it didn't last too long maybe a couple of years but from that um the scene spread the scene spread from the uk and then it went you know across you know to other countries even america and i ended up following that wave by by DJing you know, you know in France or Italy or or the States or wherever it might be and I've been done it ever since just 
following the wave around the world. So, it, it, you know, it was no plans. I didn't think about the future or, that, or why I was DJing. I just happened to be there at the right time. So you were kind of sometimes the center of something that went quite unplanned. Maybe that was also the, the, the success of it all, that it didn't quite have a plan. It was, there was no marketing in it. It was just free and people maybe in a quest for freedom or to feel free from the boundaries of the, the clubbing scene at the time. So everybody went to the fields and said, okay, let's have a party, no rules, uh, be happy and whatsoever. <clears throat> I think that's right. I think you're right because, uh, you know, uh, the club scene at that time was was very restrictive. You know, they they would they would, you have to wear uh, like guys would have to wear a suit. You know, for instance, and uh, you know they they closed at a certain time, and you know uh, it just, just I don't know it just seemed to be a little bit the the people that went there were just kind of ordinary people that just wanted to pick up girls or guys or whatever it might have been. And I think the rave scene was different. It was more like it just brought all kinds of people together, you know, and it just made a huge difference at the time. Definitely, I, I do agree. So um, this was the kind of, uh, as it, it has been called, the second summer of love between 88 and 89. Yeah. And um, the first emo tycoon was born. It was the smiley which had been back from the 70s or so, but then uh, they pick up from a flyer and then everybody identified until this day, a fat boy slim keeps it. So, um, so the, do you think that is a symbol or a, of a generation or a certain era that has remained over time? Yeah, well, I do remember. I don't mean I wasn't around in the first summer of love, but you know, in San Francisco, but it was basically you know the same kind of philosophy. People just wanted to do their own thing and dress how they wanted to do it, and I think that that's how it. You know, one the first summer of love identified with the second. It was just freedom for people. You know, um, and actually, you know, psychedelic or, you know, colorful clothes happened again in, you know, the 90s. Um, and, uh, I, you know, uh, the police eventually managed to, you know, stop that happening by passing laws and everything. But, um, you know, good thing is that it did change the way people thought, you know, and that was really important, you know, at the time. That was really a good spark. Now, also, I have uh, then I kept on reading because they, basically we, we are going through the years, and um, then the club in singers pants, and what was or has been your relationship with Ibiza? Because you know UK and Ibiza is like a romance forever. Yeah. Everybody's been there, but what happened to you? Well, um, I, I still play in Ibiza. I've you know played pretty much every year, but not in those kind of clubs. I think that. Um, when when the you know the Ibiza thing first happened in the um, late eighties, um, there wasn't really much of you know like people weren't really going there a, a lot. I mean there were people definitely going, but not like it is today. But then it just got too commercial for me, and I've never followed that commercial path. You know now if you go to Ibiza, there's huge posters with you know pictures of DJs and yeah, you know they're treated like. You know they're treated like stars, and and everything is so expensive, and but people feel they have to go because it's part of, you know, they're growing up. Their friends are talked about it. They, you know, they just feel they have to go, and it's for me, it's just too commercial. So when I go, I play in private villas, special occasions like that. So it's you know I don't I don't I don't even care for those commercial clubs it's not it's just not my scene well it's also privileged to have uh, then a party at a private village in Ibiza really you get the vibe of the very beginning when it was really simple and it was party and the good mood <clears throat> so over the years how have you kept your style or have you evolved with so many trends coming in and going because there, there has been the progressive wave and then the minimal wave and the techno wave and whatsoever and God knows what's coming after that. But how do you keep your style and how do you evolve to keep attracting people to the dance floor with your music and not losing your essence? Yeah, well, uh, uh, some people have just, you know, they've decided to, you know, change their style or jump on a bandwagon and they've, they've been very successful doing that. But my thing was never uh, about being successful in that way. In fact, I don't really like standing in on a stage you know, everyone looking at me. I prefer to be in the background 
uh, and just play music. So I've always really the, the bottom line for me is that if I like a track, I'll play it. I don't really care what what, what genre or where it's from or or uh, any other reason than I think it, it will work. So I've always stuck with that and. I found that everything goes in cycles. So, you know, one one year I might be not, not so in fashion, and then two years later I'll be in fashion again. People like me because uh, my sound is, is you know is the one that everyone's playing again. Right now, um, about music production. Then, how long after you started as a DJ, you had that urge to add something else or to do your own music? So at, at that moment, did you start with hardware or software or you know a couple of cans and <laughs> and the stick? What was the story about then your relationship with music? Sometimes some of these have a lot of gear. Some others start with just the bare minimal and create a track that sounds really fantastic and it's a huge success. But what was your path with the software, houseware, and you know things? Well, um, the first the first track I made was actually an accident. I mean, not an accident. It was done wasn't done for making money or because I wanted it, you know, to release the track. I, I did it just because uh, there was um, a track I played that was just wasn't long enough. I made it longer and a friend of mine played it on his radio show in London and it actually got signed to Virgin Records and made a lot of money. So I thought, great, I'll, I'll buy a, a studio from it and I bought a studio and I started making some music of my own. But again, it wasn't because I wanted particularly to put out music. It was more because I was interested in in the process, how it was made. So I started to put music out. But then I decided that uh, I'd rather pursue the path of a DJ. I want to be known as a DJ. I don't want to be known as a guy that has to put a record out to get bookings. I want people to book me because they like the way I play. So, so luckily for me, and I'm sure I'm, you know, there's not very many people that have had that kind of luck. I'm still working 35 years later without having to put out music on a regular basis, which not many people can say they can do that. You're truly lucky. I'm telling you. <laughs> I mean, it's really incredible that you know you have been in key places and key times. So that's really. You were born with some luck, definitely. Uh, and um, <clears throat> speaking of luck and things and charms, today we have then our um, Halloween celebration. Any costume for the night? Yeah, me. I've got. Uh, I'm not. I haven't brought a costume with me tonight, but I'm sure sure something will happen. You know. But um, I'm looking forward to to playing here because uh, you know I've, I've been to Uruguay. Well, I've been to Montevideo a couple of times. And it's always been a really good party, so I think it's going to be a really good one tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, good, definitely. So, um, if you have some more clothes, you know we have the hotel's kitchen now near. Uh, so some strawberry sauce, and you have you know on the clothes, and you have an instant zombie. So <laughs> I could do that, couldn't I? No, um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I just uh, maybe I just keep myself out of the way, you know, and no one will notice. Hopefully, you know, I could be I could be a ghost in the shadows or something like that. That's an art. That's truly an art. <laughs> Now, speaking also of luck, people will be really lucky in New York's evening because you have been booked along a, a whole set of legendary people. So, you know, I, I feel envy <laughs> really for New Yorkers. So what's going to be that party like in, in a New York's eve evening for you? Um, I mean, is something really special? Is something that you take family with to be together uh, in New York? Because you will be at Wiggle. Uh, so, what's it like when you have uh, that kind of New Year's evening parties? Do you take family? Do you call them first? Any rituals for that New Year evening? No, not really. I mean, we go, we go. It's one of those parties that I've been involved with for a long time. You know, and I don't know. It's like over 20 years old. I think it's the longest running underground party in London. But um, we've had our ups and downs recently. One of the founders, uh, you know, his wife died of cancer. So it kind of took us out of. Well, we just haven't been doing parties anymore. So this will be the first party that we've done for maybe over two years. So um, it's more like a going to be like a reunion thing for us, you know. But uh, what I did like, what I still like about Wiggle is that we we attract um, a crowd that um, that comes again just for the music. They don't. We don't really put flyers out we 
it's always been a word of mouth event is what I'm trying to say is and that's the ones I like I like best of all I don't we're not looking for people to, off, to come off the street we're not you know we don't we just want people to come to, uh, the, our friends to come and then our friends to invite their friends to come and that's how it's grown and that's how it should be I think with 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 parties you you, you want people around you that that you know you know there's not going to be a problem or a fight or and that they're into the music and and I think that's what's kept us going for so long that's why we've got such a a name and such a following it's because we haven't ever done anything other than what we believe in well even in this uh, era of you know social media and promotions and having a top 100 DJs on <laughs> yeah. DJ magazine with a big fight I mean DJs for votes and then having this kind of party with word of mouth and barely no promotion speaks really of loyalty yeah. um, so it's then loyalty to the music and probably to the feeling yeah. so wh what's the feeling of that party how would you describe it in some words oh i don't know i don't know i just think you know all the guys that are involved you know that they're, they're all kind of their their personalities are that that they're, they're you know similar to myself they're not not interested in you know in the fame in you know that's not part of it and i think that's really what's ruined the scene is that too many people too many djs nowadays um they're in it for the wrong reasons or you know they're in it for other reasons than we are they're in it for the money you know for the travel for the fame for the girls or whatever it might be you know and it's never that's never been an issue for us and i think that that's what gives us our longevity is that we just we do everything from the heart and if you do it that way i think that that in that at the end of the day you can look back and be proud of what you've done and and uh, if it's not successful then it's not successful you do something else but at least you you know you've you've not done something that's fake you've done it from from, from the heart definitely well your words are really inspiring <laughs> really and um, I, i think that you know even if it looks uh, to yourself it looks humble i mean there is or oh, you have conquered the true key of success i mean being uh, then from the late 80s or the mid 80s until these days which is 2018 and you're still playing and you know relying simply on your art yeah. uh, there must be some kind of key communication between then your audience and you um, how do you read your audience if you if you, if you do yeah well, well i you know i I think when, nowadays it's it's probably more about experience, you know, that I've done it for so long, it's kind of second nature, probably like riding a bike or something, you know, that that I can I, I can I can pick tracks that, uh, that I know that are going to work, um, like a lot of DJs do, but then I try and mix in mostly my styles. So I'm, I'm always running that that line in between knowing what I want and knowing what the crowd want. And I think that that's the key. Weird after you know you've had a lot of experiences, is been able to get that line right to know how to play. It just it just, just happens over time. I don't know. I can't. I don't think there's a formula. But maybe just just keep doing it and it will happen. You know. <laughs> Definitely, and we could speak for hours and hours. But then um, we are going to get ready for this Halloween party. Myself, I'll, I, I'd have to th then dress up. I have a costume. Oh, okay. I, I cannot reveal, but you know, it will be scandalous. <laughs> Although I have seen some people around here, so I don't be quite scandalous. Um, but we'll see. <laughs> Now, um, for all of the people around the, the world that will, at some point will listen to this interview, so some words of wisdom or you know whatever message you have for your fans and friends. Oh, I don't know if I've got any like words of wisdom. I mean, the end of the I can you know say to people is like just you know do your own thing, and I'm sure it will work out good for you in the end. You know, that's it really. Yeah. Okay, so this is a, a true message of peace, love, unity, and respect, and good luck. And then from Eddie Richards, Eddie, thank you so much uh, for this short interview. Uh, I really wanted to do with this interview with you already for almost two years since we had that conversation at another party at the basement <laughs> in a different neighborhood here in the city. So thank you so much for this night, and uh, I'm sure that we will enjoy it really a lot. Well, thank you, um, you know, and see everybody tonight here in Montevideo, Uruguay. Bye.
So you have to listen to believe it. Uh, and it's Eddie Richards in the mix tonight with us. Thank you so much. And keep on listening to Vitamina.